Story time with Stephanie Hello, uh, I am art historical novelist Stephanie Story. Welcome to my show, Story Time. This is where I get to talk to other writers about their passions and process. My guest today is a longtime writer and journalist for publications such as Vanity Fair and Architectural Digest and New Yorker and New York Times. He's also the author of a lot of books including Airborne, The Triumph and Struggle of Michael Jordan, Pre-Pop Warhol, an art fan, so we're gonna art geek a little bit, it'll be good. And he also collaborated with famed dancer and one of my personal obsessions, Twyla Tharp, on The Collaborative Habit. But his newest was just out earlier this year. It's a novel called JFK and Mary Meyer, a love story, historical fiction, lots to talk about. Thank you for coming to the show. Welcome, Jesse Kornbluth. I am thrilled to be here. Uh, yeah, no, no. Thank you for coming because it, it, you do you write a lot of about a lot about things that I really care about about art and and this novel is historical fiction. So why don't we start there? Why don't you tell our the viewers at home? Because I hate butchering other people's novels when they do it to me. I'm like, oh, what did you just say about my book? Tell the viewers at home about your latest, your novel, the JFK love story book, uh, and and then we'll talk about the the research process and all that stuff. Well, let me start by saying I loved school. I'm the kid who liked writing term papers. Mm -hmm. I've always felt that editors are the hand of God and I'm being asked to do something that I need to know right then. And so I always listen when people tell me things. And as you know, if two or three people say something within a week, it's actionable, right? That is truly the hand of God. And a friend mentioned to me about the murder of Mary Meyer. Biographical footnote. I went to a boarding school near Boston. One of her kids went to that school. My brother was that kid's advisor. Additionally, I went to the school with kids who were close to JFK. I mean, Bobby and Teddy Kennedy went to my school, as well as a kid named Sandy Spaulding, whose father, Chuck Spaulding, was Kennedy's best friend. So when I heard about Mary Meyer, I looked her up, and this is the Mary Meyer story. Jack Kennedy, as we know, slept with everyone he could. Uh, I forget the actress who said it was the most exciting seven minutes of my life. He was a terrible lover, completely uninterested in his partner, often didn't know her name. He took the virginity of an intern at the White House four days after she arrived in his wife's bed. Uh, he propositioned Marlena Dietrich, who his father had slept with, and she said, well, we have to be downstairs in 30 minutes. He said, fine, because <laughs> he knew it wasn't going to take that long. So he was a completely uncaring, selfish lover, a sex addict, really, for any number of reasons. But in 1936, at a choked dance, he met Mary Pinchot, and she was the package. She was everything Jackie was and hot. Everybody loved her, and he got nowhere with her. But later, when she married, she and her husband lived next to where Jack and Jackie lived in Virginia. They became friends. And after the divorce, Mary was a frequent guest at the White House. Additionally, her sister was married to Ben Bradley, who was Kennedy's close associate and source, and also a CIA asset for his entire career. So they were friends. and. In October of 1961, at a lunch, he looks across and he suddenly goes, wow, Mary. He suddenly sees her as a woman and he pursues her. And finally, six months later, they become lovers. And she becomes the only lasting lover of the last two years of his life, which is not to say he was faithful, <laughs> not at all, but they, had an, they, they understood one another. She was having other affairs too. She was by then a painter, but very social. She would move in the same circles. So he, and he tells her at one point, something I don't think he meant, that after the 64 election, he was going to divorce Jackie and marry her. 
And she said, Jack, you'll cheat on me. He said, you'll cheat on me. So uh, they, they were kind of well matched and she didn't take crap from him. And she had very liberal views and she advised him on foreign policy and she pushed him to do something about the poor. She pushed him to make peace with Russia and those things he did and those things may have contributed to his murder. So he's killed. A year after he's killed, she's walking on the towpath in Georgetown as she does every day at lunch and she takes a bullet in the head and a bullet in the chest and dies. That night, Angleton of the CIA is, comes to her house with a bolt cutter. Now, Ben Bradley and his wife have gotten a call. Mary had a diary, go get it. So they go and they all meet outside and they hunt and hunt for the diary. And eventually, many stories of how, who found what, they found what they called the diary, but which was a, an art notebook with 19 cryptic references to an unknown lover. The diary went back and forth. It went to the CIA, got back to the Bradleys, and they burned it. So I thought, why not write the diary? Uh, not as a novel, but write it as a diary using the research from 150 books. I had enough that I could reconstruct the romance against the backdrop of the history of the Kennedy administration. So I could do several things at once. It's a novel that has footnotes. And in some cases, the footnotes are really funny. So, uh, I mean, the book is, is fun. There's a lot of pillow talk. There's a lot of sass. It reads like a screenplay. All my fiction now reads like a screenplay for another reason, because I basically don't think people want to read now. And so you have to make it easy on the eye and make it fast. You can read this book very quickly. So the point is, it was a story that was hidden in plain sight. And as we talk, you'll see hidden in plain sight is a large theme of everything I do. Um, I'm not like an imaginative genius. Um, I'm also live in New York City. I'm 74 years old. I have an 18 year old daughter who went to a private school, who goes to a real college. Mike Nichols said, I'm an artist, but I'm a commercial artist. Me too. I know how much I need to make a year just to walk around. And so when my friends write literary fiction, I think A, trust fund, B, rich marriage, you know, something because to write a book and sell 3,000 copies, that's a really bad day. And so when my friends say, oh, when I finish a book, I think about this. And I say, when I finish a book, I look for the check. So Mary Meyer is a perfect example of what I do now. It's a story that can dance on many platforms. It can be a play. It can be a streaming series, it could be a movie. And the trick of writing at this point in this business is to see how many times you can get paid for the same material. <laughs> Thus, Mary Meyer. The shocking part to me that Mary Meyer, even though there was obviously a lot of historical material about her, I, she's not like a, for me, for the lay person about, about JFK. You know, I, I'm interested in presidential history. I read a lot of American history. I'm obviously a hi historical buff, so I read a lot. But I really didn't know anything about her until I started researching you and your book. It does surprise me that she's sort of hiding in plain sight. What made her the right person to write about now? Was there something about this moment that she felt particularly right for? Or you just happened to be the one to find her? Or, do you know what I mean? In 2018, I think, my uh, ex-wife and my daughter and I took a cruise. Okay. We had never taken a cruise and we thought maybe. It was a terrible idea. I had a list of projects that I could think about while I was on the cruise. Mary Meyer was one of them. 
I spent every waking hour doing the Google on Mary Meyer. It isn't that it was right for now. Look, uh, uh, Ezra Pound says, the artist is the antenna of the race, right? It's like, if you know it, it's like an early warning system. Uh, Tina Brown used to say, a good time to get interested in something is when everybody's gone, right? Everybody's passed it over. And the other thing she said, which is very true, which is when we get bored with something, other people are just getting interested in it. So it wasn't like in 2018, I was thinking, you know, in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, people are really going to want to think about JFK because they're not, right? No. I do what I think I'm supposed to do. I don't know another way to go. If I, it's not like, oh, I wrote a thriller and it worked and now it's got to do one every year. That isn't me. I have a very checkered career. There's no clear path. There's no one expertise. And that's both the good thing and the bad thing about what I've done. I love that there's no clear path, but you did say that you do oftentimes uncover story, like you do oftentimes try to shine a light on a story that it previously maybe hasn't been covered that was hiding in plain sight. Is that a theme that runs through all of your work or have you seen a different theme that runs through all of your work, even though it's different and it's varied? Because every artist I think has their own point of view, right? We all bring ourselves to it. One, I don't think of myself as an artist. I'm in the construction business, I'm a carpenter. I take material and I assemble it and I make it into a frame. And if the frame works, it's a success, right? So let us remember that starting at age eight, I was a writer. I was writing for a weekly newspaper in Manhattan when I was 16. I worked for Look Magazine and got to write when I was 19. I published my first nonfiction book when I was 21. And then I was a journalist for like almost half a century. And as a journalist, I mostly got assignments. Yep. You know, editors had a sense of who I was or what I could do and they gave it to me. At Vanity Fair, I wrote more stories, I think some years than any of the other contributing writers. I also had more pieces that didn't run. What were those pieces? My ideas. So I learned shut up and do what Tina wants you to do, because then that works. In 1993, I left Vanity Fair. I moved on to the internet. I started a book site. I went to AOL. And in 2003, I came out a writer again. A year later, I started headbutler.com, which is a cultural concierge site. Instead of working with 150 people, as I did at AOL, I worked with myself. There was only one person to blame. I liked doing it and I built a community out of it. And um, I've done a, just a couple of pieces of journalism in the last few years. You know, I can write 700 words against a deadline and uh, I can write, uh, I'm collaborating on two books now. Uh, I can write nonfiction against a deadline. Writing my novel is different because um, I don't make an outline and I'm channeling it. Uh, nobody creates at the desk that I know. No one creates at the easel. You get your ideas, you know, people say, oh, I got this idea in the shower. Yeah, exactly. I get my ideas. I need to walk 12,000 steps a day in decent weather. And uh, I get my marching orders and I walk with the three by five card and I take notes and I come back and I type it out. I'm not that smart. You know, I have a, I'm will, but I'm, gotten to be a little more humble in my old age and I accept contributions from the higher power. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and again, everything's hidden in plain sight. I mean, you think I've written lots about art, right? Uh, Twilight I mean, Art. I mean, I mean, it does seem to ha have this through line in, in your work and you're working on a Matisse play and, and, and only, maybe there is that element sometimes. If only my darling, if only. Andy Warhol died on a Sunday. There is no better time for someone to die on a, on a Sunday if uh, you were working at a weekly magazine. So I was gonna go to California and, and interview some film people and Ed Kozner said, no, stay and do Warhol. So I interviewed, I spent the rest of Sunday reading. I interviewed everybody on Monday. 
On Wednesday, I turned in 8,000 words. So that led to a book called Prepop Warhol, not a book that I thought of. It came to me. So there. But so you could say, I mean, Matisse. Mm -hmm. I wrote a play about Matisse. I had never written a play. I mean, I'd written a third grade play, but I'd never written dramatic material. I'd never acted. I don't go to the theater. And when I do, I hate it. Um, Matisse, I discovered that at the end of his life, he created his masterpiece, which is the Chapel at Vance, and he made it as an homage to a nurse who had been very helpful to him when he was sick and who had then become a nun. And it's in every art book for a paragraph, even though he said it was the masterpiece of his career. So there I go. I read you know, a hundred books about Matisse. I pull out everything I can find, all the great quotes, and I write this play. And it turns out, I hate to say this because there's nothing worse than a writer who thinks he's good, but it turns out to be fantastic. And it was done twice and it was on its way to New York when the plague struck. And it still may be done on Netflix with Al Pacino as Matisse, which would be nice again, but it wasn't, I mean, I looked at the material, it wasn't a book. This was a visual artist, right? Uh, he had ideas that you could say, you could use in a literary way, but no, you wanted to see it. You wanted to see the process. You wanted to see him work with the nun, work with the nurse, uh, fight uh, her mother superior. You wanted the drama. And, uh, and then at the end, there's a fantastic effect that can only be done in the theater. He dies. The nun comes back to his apartment. It's empty. And she says, I know you hated when I prayed for you, but I'm gonna do it one more time. And she prays to him and then she turns and raises her arms. And as the uh, Haydn Gloria starts playing in the background, the theater goes dark and it suddenly explodes and you're inside the chapel. And it ends on this note of triumph. He died loved and loving. He died in his own bed. He died having made his masterpiece. It's exactly what any sane person would want. So it's the, I mean, I write love stories and I write happy endings. That's the deal. And this was the happiest ending. So yeah, art. Okay, but you can say, you said her, I'm a commercial artist. I do what comes my way. I just, I, I just take the assignments as they come. Except, I hate to tell you this, Jesse, when you talk about Matisse and when you talked about the Mary Meyer story, which are stories that you got to pick for yourself, you light up, you get excited, you lean toward the camera, you get all sort of, you get all artisty about it. I hate to tell you that. So. No. No, I don't get artsy. I don't. Let me tell you what I do get. Okay. There is no fiction. There is no drama. There is no, mem there's only memoir. I was Mary Meyer. That's why I, a guy was able to pull it off. No one said, oh, this is a really kind of a stretch. It's this guy, no one said, he absolutely understood what it was to be Mary Meyer. I was regrettably JFK, which was extremely uncomfortable and unpleasant. I was Matisse, I was the nun. In my new book, I am 16 years old and I live in a suburb. I am, if I, if I am not everybody in the story, the story fails. It is that simple. And you don't think that's you being an artist? I'm serious. I mean, you're inhabiting other people and, and you're going with it fully. I know a lot of people who can't do that. The term makes me so uneasy. It's like when they say, oh, you're an author. I say, no, an author is a dead writer, right? I mean, an author is got prizes and is bronze and is sort of full of shit at a certain point. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I'm a worker. I mean, 
once I was interviewing Jonathan Demme and he was going to do Silence of the Lambs and I wanted to write it for him desperately and he was going to hire Michelle Pfeiffer and I had written a piece about Jodie Foster and I said, Jonathan, Jodie Foster is the only authentic blue collar actress out there. And I called Jodie and I said, you really want to go after this. And she thanked me on Oscar night. So yeah, you got to know who you are. I'm not a hack, but I don't have an opinion of myself that gets in the way of my doing my work. I'm a worker. I'm a blue collar worker. I love that because I think I think so many times when people approach writing or like when I teach writing, they, they aspiring writers have too much of an idealistic vision of their head of what it means to be a writer, as opposed to just the sitting down and doing the work every single day and pushing it whether you want to or not. So what is your, what, what is and your- Stephen King says he has written the first paragraph 75 times often. I don't do it that much, but the first sentence is so key. Like I wrote a novel called Married Sex and it begins, there is no woman more beautiful than a woman reading a book. Yeah, why did I do that? One, I think that. Two, the man is watching his wife read and he's loving watching her read. And three, I'm thinking that most of my readers are gonna be women and I'm sucking up to them right at the beginning. So yeah, uh, yeah. And you have to remember, particularly now, you're not paying people to read you and you're not even competing with other books. You're competing with everything for people's time and attention. I volunteered to teach in a public high school here a few years ago, ninth grade English one day a week. And I said, who do you think writes more every day? And they said, well, you, you're a professional writer. I said, no, you, you text all day. You write more and you text and you have a purpose, right? You wanna get the girl, you wanna do this, you wanna do that. You know, having a purpose is really important. My purpose is to be read. My purpose is to be entertaining. I am in show business. I am nothing else. I am a carpenter in show business. That's what I do. This was a fascinating conversation. You're a fascinating guy um, with so much experience and, and, and such a great perspective on this craft thing that we call writing. Um, so thank you so much for joining me, for taking the time to join me in cyberspace to talk about your work and the process and all of this madness, I so appreciate it. I so appreciate all of your insights. Thank you. I'm now looking forward to reading your book and I'm hoping I'm gonna be turning the pages like mad. Oh, good, I hope so too. That's always my favorite compliment, so fingers crossed. Okay, uh, <laughs> thank you, um, thank everybody. You. Uh, I will see you next story time, bye, -bye. Time with Stephanie Story. Story time virtually. We've got time and plenty of stories, talking stories in a novel way. Story time with Stephanie Story.